Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, now we are going to uh, begin to take a look at the uh, evidence uh, that we need to make strategic decisions uh, about PepsiCo. And so I'll bring up the uh, recording for uh, the first part of uh, evidence that we're going to be considering. And we'll get going. Uh, so here we are. Uh, we're going to uh, take a look at the external environment, uh, which includes uh, the economy, markets, and industry structure, and we'll draw a few conclusions. Uh, so first, the economy. Uh, and uh, these are the uh, primary uh, countries or regions uh, where PepsiCo does business. Uh, and uh, we'll be taking a look at uh, all of their economies. Uh, you can see uh, over on the left side, uh, in the upper left-hand corner, uh, China, uh, the United States, and Europe. Uh, and uh, the red line is China. You've probably seen this graph in other presentations, but when uh, the value of economies are computed on a purchasing power parity, uh, we see that China uh, surpassed uh, or caught up with the United States at the very end of 2013. And after that, uh, has uh, continued to uh, increase the distance between its uh, size and the size of the U.S. and European economies. Uh, the European uh, Union uh, has, uh, let's see, uh, 28 countries until... Uh, the uh, until England or the United Kingdom withdraws. Uh, and so no surprise, uh, the, the European economy is slightly larger than the U.S. Um, we also see a rather rapid growth rate in India. Uh, but be sure to take a look at the scale. Um, the size of the Indian economy uh, is nowhere near uh, the size of China's or the U.S., uh, if I take a look at about 2016 or 2015, we see that India has a uh, GDP value of about uh, $8 trillion. Uh, and at uh, the same time, and that, that's, uh, that's, that's, a, that's about last year, at about the same time, uh, China had a value of uh, about $20 trillion. So uh, it's uh, well over twice as large as India. So uh, you just need to, uh, it's in the, the shape of India's e economic growth is important, but we need to bear in mind also the, just the absolute size. Uh, we can see that uh, Brazil and Mexico uh, also, uh, we need to look at the size of their economies and uh, again, they're, they're nowhere near the size of uh, either India or uh, China. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, we see that Brazil was a rapid growth economy until recently. Uh, there's been a great deal of political turmoil and turbulence in that economy. Value line projects that after this year, it'll start to grow again. The dotted line with the arrow indicates that uh, it, it's just possible that uh, Brazil won't get out of its currently turbulent state because uh, the uh, government is still uh, very uh, unstable. Uh, the current president has a very low approval rating, and there's a real good chance that he won't be reelected in the next election. Uh, and uh, I believe that Brazil's had three presidents in the last four years, so. Um, it's a very unstable economy. Mexico, on the other hand, uh, has a, a nicer, uh, more continuous, steady growth trajectory uh, and is probably going to continue uh, to grow steadily. So uh, Mexico, uh, especially since it's so close to the U.S., looks more attractive as an investment site uh, than Brazil does right now. Uh, but in any event, when we just look at these charts, we see that China is the growth market of the present, India is the growth market of the future, and another target probably 
uh, is uh, Mexico just because it's growing and it's so close to home. Um, here are the uh, growth rates of GDP per capita calculated again on a per, whoops on a purchasing power parity basis. And now you can see in the upper left corner, China is at the lowest uh, level. Although its economy is larger than the U.S., it's got a, uh, something like uh, four times as many people. It's got about 1.4. Uh, billion people. The U.S. has about 325 billion people. Uh, so uh, that being the case, uh, an economy that is uh, not too much larger than the U.S. is divided by four times as many people, and so the GDP per capita uh, is lower than the U.S., uh, the blue line being the U.S., dotted line Europe. Um, and what's important here is GDP per capita is an indicator of consumption potential. As this indicator goes up, so does the potential that people will buy things. Um, now, this is a gross oversimplification, but it does seem to uh, work. Uh, we can see that India is on a growth trajectory. Again, uh, take a look at the y-axis at the size of the values there. And uh, most recently, uh, GDP per capita in India was about $6,000 compared to uh, something like $12,000 in China um, and uh, um, $40,000 in Europe and uh, almost $60,000 in the US. So again, these things are relative, but uh, when you look at the growth rate in India, it's pretty obvious that something's going on there. And uh, once again, uh, China is the growth rate of the present. Uh, India is the growth uh, country, rather, or the growth market of the future. We also see uh, in the lower chart that Brazil uh, is demonstrating those same characteristics that I mentioned before, it really took a dip in the last couple of years because of the turbulence in politics and the government. Mexico, on the other hand, uh, keeps moving forward. This is an interesting chart, and frankly, it's more useful in asset-intensive industries uh, like uh, uh, John Deere, for instance, uh, when it comes to uh, capital-intensive industries. Uh, but this is, these are indicators of the saving rates when we include corporate profits as well as consumer savings. Uh, because corporate profits are, are a form of savings as well, aren't they? Um, they uh, it's the difference between what the company uh, spends and what the company takes in. Uh, and when you do that, uh, the difference between what you spend and your earnings is your savings. So this is, uh, these are gross savings, uh, but uh, you can see that the red line on the top uh, is China, and although it's coming down as would be expected in a country that is starting to move into the more developed category, uh, it's still much higher than the others. The green line is India, indicating uh, again that India is starting to generate capital that can be used to grow the infrastructure and other elements of the economy. And then at lower levels, we have the uh, more developed uh, countries and regions of the Euro area, the European Union. The Euro area is the 17 uh, countries in Europe that use the Euro as its currency. And you can see Russia uh, not doing uh, too much either. So those ma more mature countries, including the US, uh, simply are not uh, generating capital for reinvestment in the economy, like those two big developing nations of China and India. The uh, GDP saving rates in Latin America are uh, more erratic, uh, especially Venezuela. You've heard a lot about Venezuela in the news. It used to be with all of their petroleum production that they were really uh, generating uh, capital that they could use to increase uh, the, uh, uh, the infrastructure and the, uh, the internals of the Venezuelan economy. But with a reduction in the uh, price of oil, 
and the turbulence in its economy, you can see that that's completely a thing of the past. Here are some unemployment rates in the major countries, and you can see that they've all come down from uh, the, uh, uh, the time when we were at a worldwide banking crisis and a great big recession in the uh, uh, developed nations of uh, the United States and Euro uh, area. Uh, however, uh, there is one of these, uh, the Euro area, and it's got, uh, it continues to uh, suffer from relatively high unemployment. Now, it's difficult to look at that number and make much of it, and that's because there's quite a variation between the maturity uh, and uh, the stability of uh, the 28 countries in the European Union. Nevertheless, you get the general idea. Where do you see unemployment the lowest? Well, it's in China. That, that has a lot to do with the type of political and government system uh, that China operates. Uh, it may not be our kind of system, but everybody works. Uh, then in Latin America, uh, we see again Brazil at a very high. I mean, it, you can see that uh, it's been up to about 12%. Uh, it's right now in the, uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's uh, right now in about the 10% level and it's expected to go higher. So I had that a little backwards, but find 10% on the chart over on the left and you can see that 10% is a lot higher uh, than uh, other countries with the exception of, of uh, uh, the European Union. So uh, again, you've got to put these things in uh, comparative perspective. You can see also that Argentina seems to be coming along a little bit better and that Mexico is in a, uh, in a much better uh, situation employment-wise. Uh, now, again, these things need to be taken into consideration because they depend upon the record-keeping involved. And uh, you know, the record-keeping in these countries isn't uh, always as, as reliable as it is here in the U.S., so we've got some conclusions. China's the growth economy of the present. India's the growth economy of the future. China's economy is the biggest in which PepsiCo participates. Um, and it, uh, it, that it became so uh, in 2013. China uh, accumulates capital for reinvestment in its economy at a very high rate. Um, and uh, uh, China did not experience a recession when the uh, Western economies did, and India is beginning to demonstrate that uh, it has some real growth potential. So let me move these slides up a bit, and I can uh, move on. Um, so uh, more conclusions. Uh, based on their rates of growth and their consumption potential and so forth, it looks like there are four major targets for uh, the US, for PepsiCo to want to grow in China, India, the U.S., and Mexico. Brazil's economy, not too attractive, and frankly, uh, with the exception of Mexico, other Latin American countries aren't that attractive either. Mexico is. So now we'll take a look at exchange rates, um, and uh, again, we, what we'll do is go through these pretty quickly, but uh, basically, what the charts indicate is the amount of foreign currency that is required uh, to buy a dollar. And historically, you can see that it's taken uh, an increasing amount of Chinese currency to buy a dollar. Uh, in the past year, uh, that trend has reversed, but uh, the exchange rate is still high, meaning that the dollar is relatively strong relative to the Chinese yuan. Uh, but that has come down. The dollar is beginning to weaken. Uh, what's the, just to, to, we won't do this for every chart, but let's explain what this means. Essentially, if PepsiCo makes a uh, 1,000 yuan uh, in China, um, and uh, it holds on to those yuan in China uh, it will, uh, for a year, it'll take a lot more of those yuan to buy a dollar than it would have if uh, PepsiCo converted those yuan into dollars immediately, just as fast as it could, because uh, the yuan, the Chinese currency, was depreciating against the dollar. 
Now it's the other way around. Now it takes fewer yuan to buy a dollar. So if PepsiCo makes a thousand yuan and waits for a month, they'll be able to buy more dollars than if they had uh, converted those yuan into dollars a month ago. Uh, so PepsiCo, uh, in this case, may actually have an incentive to reinvest those yuan in its Chinese business rather than bring them back to the United States. Um, now, this has some real implications for some of the U.S. current uh, tax policies uh, that are being discussed in Washington, uh, but that's another issue. Um, so uh, here's the situation in India very much the same as China. Uh, here it is in Canada. Uh, things uh, got a little better in Canada uh, a little sooner, uh, but uh, you can see very recently here, it has taken fewer Canadian dollars to buy a US dollar. So uh, the Canadian dollar is stronger, it might behoove PepsiCo to leave their Canadian dollars in Canada for a while because it won't take as many of them to buy U.S. dollars if they wait a little while and reinvest that Canadian money in Canadian assets. Um, here's what's going on in Venezuela. No surprise with the uh, uh, what uh, with the political turbulence in uh, Venezuela. It's uh, it's not good. Um, here's the Russian ruble doing essentially the same thing. Uh, and uh, Brazil, as you can see, uh, it's, uh, it got really bad. Uh, the, when things started to turn down again uh, and the Brazilian real got stronger uh, was uh, when there was a change in presidents. Uh, but uh, we'll see now, uh, right, recently in the past year and a half, uh, now that Mr. Temer has been president, uh, things have stabilized. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, his approval rating is exceedingly low. Last report I saw it was less than 5%. So if the government is that unstable, uh, look out. We may have the same situation that we had between 2014 and 16. Uh, that, was, uh, that was when uh, they were changing presidents. Uh, and the, uh, the president of uh, Brazil was being impeached. Um, here is a chart that is misleading because it looks like the reverse of what we just looked at is occurring, but in fact, it's not. Uh, this is the amount of dollars required uh, to buy a euro. It's the exact reverse of, what, of the charts we just looked at. And so if we were to turn this thing upside down, we would see the same thing, in fact, that we have looked at. Uh, it now is taking a little more uh, a few more dollars to buy a euro, which means, again, the dollar in the past year has begun to weaken, whereas previously uh, it didn't take nearly as many dollars to buy a euro. It really dropped because the dollar got strong. So what we see is a history of the dollar being strong against foreign currencies until just recently. Um, that has a lot to, to say about how PepsiCo spends money to uh, build uh, manufacturing or bottling plants and uh, physical uh, facilities and to build bakeries for Frito-Lay. It also has a lot to say about what PepsiCo should be doing when it earns profits in these other countries. Until recently, uh, the best thing to do was to convert those uh, foreign currencies into dollars just as quickly as PepsiCo got their hand on them. But uh, more recently, uh, PepsiCo may have an incentive to hold on uh, to those uh, profits for a while because they're going to be worth more dollars as time passes. Okay, so exchange rate uh, issues. As the dollar strengthened against current key uh, currencies, uh, value of PepsiCo's revenues and profits de declined uh, until they were converted to dollars but that trend is reversed in recent months. Now we'll talk, that was the economy. Now we'll talk about uh, markets uh, that drive demand for PepsiCo products. And most importantly, uh, I suppose, is population because markets, consumer markets are really made out of people, aren't they? 
And uh, what do we see over on the upper right-hand corner? Uh, China uh, is the largest population, uh, probably has about one point. Uh, it, it, the, the suggestion here is that it's about 1.375 people. It's good for all intents, it's 1.4 uh, billion people. Uh, and uh, India, a little over 1.3 and gaining rapidly. You've probably heard about China's one child policy, uh, which is resulting in fewer young people and a lot more older ones, which causes some real economic problems for China. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, and the fertility rate, of course, is, is quite low in China, even after the one child policy has been ended. Uh, the, um, uh, the, I've been to China in the past year, spent a lot of time in a lot of cities there, and I can tell you uh, that uh, uh, there's no great incentive uh, or no great desire for people uh, to have a lot of kids. Uh, they're kind of used to the way things are going with limited uh, fertility, that is low birth rates, uh, two people working, uh, increasing their standards of living and so forth. Um, the idea of one, of one member of the family staying home to raise a child or two children, uh, that's, uh, that, that, that's not uh, what a lot of young people are thinking about doing. On the other hand, in India, uh, the birth rate has now come down to 2.5, which means for every two parents, there's an average of two and a half kids. Um, and uh, in the past, it's been a lot higher than that. Uh, but as long as it stays over two, uh, India's population will continue to grow. As long as it stays under two, uh, China's population will peak and then decline. Uh, so uh, the demographers tell me that if we look out to 2050, we'll see maybe 1.2 billion people in China and 1.5 billion people in uh, in India, more or less, I mean, and I'm grossly simplifying, I really don't recall the exact numbers, but no doubt about it, China's uh, population will soon surpass that of China, uh, India's population will soon surpass that of China, um, and the significance uh, for PepsiCo is quite important because you remember that curve that we saw earlier in GDP per capita. India's population is far from China's or the U.S. Uh, in so far as uh, uh, standards of living uh, and uh, uh, living conditions are concerned. But uh, as time passes, uh, there are going to be a lot more people that are able to consume uh, PepsiCo products uh, than there are in China. Now that'll take a while. Right now there are more people that have uh, a, what you might call middle-class uh, spending power in China uh, than in India. Um, uh, but uh, th those things are changing. And by the way, if China has about one point, let me round it down to 1.2 billion people, uh, a third of those, uh, and we know it's more like 1.4, uh, about a third of those are in middle class or better. That's 400 million people. The total population of the U.S. is only 325 million people. So <clears throat> China is a major marketing growth target, and every company that wants to grow in consumer, or for that matter, industrial products, needs to be trying to do business in China. Uh, and now we can see why. That is especially the case in consumer products markets, such as those that uh, PepsiCo participates in. Um, the bottom chart is the, are the populations of Brazil and Mexico. Brazil is a lot bigger than Mexico, but again, its problem is economic turbulence. Okay, so conclusions. China uh, population is the world's largest. India will pass China's. Uh, very soon, uh, U.S. population is about three and a quarter million. It'll grow a little bit, uh, mainly due to immigration. Our birth rate isn't very high at all. It's right around 2.0, uh, maybe a hair or less than that. Uh, but uh, immigration is what makes our population grow. Um, Latin American populations uh, aren't as large as the uh, U.S. Uh, and uh, 
uh, however, they're also growing. European populations, some of them like Russia and Eastern European countries, actually are declining. Okay, this takes us to a discussion of the, uh, the beverage markets. Uh, and uh, right away, we can see some major changes going on here. Uh, here are the major brands in the soft drink market. And we see a couple things going on. Uh, the number one brand is Coke. Uh, and, uh, you know, 4 billion gallons uh, versus 2 billion gallons for Pepsi or less, actually less. Um, but if we, and if we look at the changes from 2015 to 16, uh, we see uh, some uh, significant declines even in Mountain Dew, my favorite, because it was launched right around the time I went there and I got, I got to the point where I was a Mountain Dew addict because everybody who worked at PepsiCo got all their beverages without paying for them. We could get as much as we wanted and I just, I just got addicted to Mountain Dew when I worked there. In any event, uh, you can see that the share of volume, uh, even for Coke, is dropping. It's dropping sharper for uh, Pepsi, Mountain Dew, a little bit less. Uh, and remember, these are brands rather than companies. Uh, and so uh, notice that Gatorade is still at number six, and it actually grew a little bit. And that's the next thing to look at. What we've got at the top where we see declines are carbonated beverages, but uh, in the middle, we see the non, the uncolas and sometimes the 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 sport or healthy drinks, Nestle Pure Life, Gatorade, Sprite, um, and they're growing modestly. They're not growing real rapidly, but they are growing. Okay, uh, and then we get down to bottled water, and uh, oh my, look at uh, Aquafina, which is PepsiCo's drink growing at almost 11% compared to Coke's Dasani. And I can tell you that this year, Aquafina has surpassed Dasani. And back in the old days when, when uh, uh, PepsiCo launched a, a strategy aimed at non-carbonated, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, non-carbonated beverages, uh, Tropicana, Gatorade, and Aquafina, all three of those brands uh, surpassed the Coca-Cola brands. Uh, the comparison to Tropicana uh, was uh, Minute Me. The comparison to Dasani uh, is Aquafina. Uh, the comparison to, uh, Trop to uh, Gatorade uh, was uh, Powerade and I can tell you that uh, the Coke folks really don't think much of Powerade at all. Um, if you're like most people, you don't either. But you see a real uh, uh, categorization here. Carbonated beverages declining. The sports and drinks and uncolas sort of holding their own, uh, just sort of stable. And then the growth drinks have been the, the, from the healthy drink, from the water drinks. And uh, that has really influenced uh, analysts of the uh, uh, soft drink industry. So here are trends in those shares that we just looked at. And what do we see? We see PepsiCo's share declining over time. Uh, by uh, something like two and a half share points. That's a lot of beverage. We see that Coke has just about held its own at 42%. And we see making up the difference uh, to some extent is Dr. Pepper. Now I can tell you ahead of time before we get to, to this point in detail that PepsiCo has just recognized that there are health problems with carbonated beverages and that they, they are uh, declining in consumer preference and consumption, as we saw on the last chart. So PepsiCo has just decided not to compete very aggressively uh, for this market share, to let it go, uh, and instead uh, to compete in the uh, healthier drink categories. So here we see uh, basically that's those same trends with uh, Coca-Cola holding firm, 
uh, Pepsi Cola declining and Dr. Pepper increasing over time. By the way, this yellow other category includes some of those. Uh, so, so I'm trying to remember some of the names of these, uh, uh, you know, power drinks as we call them. But they're really starting to gain uh, some market share too. And uh, PepsiCo needs to keep their eyes on those guys. Now, India is a completely different animal. Remember, India is that growth market we talked about. Uh, and when we look at it, we see uh, that uh, a big uh, part of uh, the uh, commercial drink uh, market in India uh, is bottled water, uh, even much larger than in the US. Uh, and that juices also make up a pretty large portion of the market. And that carbonated beverages uh, are not looked on very favorably at all. And later on, uh, I think when we get to the strategy section, uh, I'll show you some media advertisements uh, that were run in India uh, that encourage people not to drink carbonated beverages because they're just not good for your health. Um, uh, another thing uh, that we mentioned uh, is the uh, simply much different uh, culture uh, much different uh, uh, beverage preferences in India. So you can see that back in 2013, Pepsi had a pretty good share. Um, uh, however, and this was, uh, uh, it, they held on to it in 2014, but uh, it was not to remain. Uh, Tang uh, starts, uh, and by the way, uh, Slice and Tropicana non-colas were right there uh, making their mark. Uh, Coke was down to number six. Uh, you can see over in 2015, it's, it's still uh, got about a 5%, uh, uh, I'm sorry, 5% share. It was number five. Uh, uh, Tropicana was number four. But Tang and Real, uh, Ruz Afsa, uh, these are local brands, Real Tang, by the way, is a product of Mondelez. Um, we used to drink a lot of it in the United States. Uh, it's a powder. It's got a citric flavor, and you can put health, you can put vitamins in it. And so people mix it up in water and drink it like a uh, beverage. And it's uh, it, it's it's a it's an important uh, product in India. Uh, but uh, the, I think the point is that whoops. Uh, that uh, there are a lot of local brands uh, in India, and there is a lot of preference for uh, juices and drinks other than carbonated beverages. So, carbonated soft drinks declining, bottled water increasing, athletic drinks sort of holding their own. Uh, Pepsi's share of carbonated soft drinks, 27% and declining. Cokes is 42, holding its own, um, maybe dropping a little bit. And India is a unique market. And why the reason we pay so much attention to it is that that's the growth market of the future. Uh, so we're going to have to plan accordingly. We're going to have to take into account what it is that people in India want rather than what we want to sell them. Okay, uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about snack foods. And you can see uh, that there are two categories of snacks in the United States uh, that uh, make up half of all snack food uh, categories. Uh, salty snacks, which are made by Frito-Lay, and surprisingly, fruit and vegetables. Uh, so if, if you take those out, the distance between uh, salty snacks and the other categories uh, are uh, is pretty large. The only other category is the so-called indulgent snacks like ice cream and stuff that makes you fat and clogs your arteries. When we look at the world's top uh, foods uh, in consumer pro oops, wait a minute, pardon me. Um, Yeah, let me put this one up here. I don't know how that happened. 
Uh, so here is the same thing that we just saw in the form of a bar chart. Now I can go to that next chart. Um, and here are the uh, top uh, consumer food, uh, consumer beverage and snack food companies in the world. Um, and you can see that PepsiCo's uh, Frito-Lay is what it is. It's got uh, Quaker in there too, but it's primarily Frito-Lay. You can see that it's just worlds larger than anybody else. And frankly, Frito-Lay is the dominant company in that industry. Now, right next to it uh, is Kellogg's that makes some snack foods, uh, breakfast bars mainly. And, uh, and then you can read the others uh, along the bottom there. Um, notice uh, that the uh, squares are the growth rates, annual growth rates. Uh, and that was during uh, 2013 to 14. Uh, so recent, but not real recent. These things don't change too much over time. Um, and uh, mainly Frito-Lay over here at uh, something like 7% is holding its own really well. Um, we see that there's uh, one company that has a 10% growth rate back then. Uh, General Mills was at about 8%. Uh, there was one small company, very small company, had a growth rate of 30%. Uh, but generally, uh, Frito-Lay, PepsiCo's Frito-Lay uh, subsidiary is the 10,000-pound gorilla and holding its own, growing nicely. So uh, it certainly is under no threat of being surpassed or caught up with. If we take a look at the uh, market for snack foods, we can see uh, that uh, chips really make a difference. We've got potato chips at 24%. We've got uh, tortilla and corn chips at 20 And we've got uh, other chips at about 19 So we've got uh, 63 maybe 64% of the snack food industry market is made up of chips. Uh, and, uh, of course, that's what Frito-Lay makes. So... These are happy numbers for Frito-Lay. Um, and who's the, who are the big companies? Uh, PepsiCo's Frito-Lay represents 41% of the market for snack foods. Uh, that's pretty uh, dominant when you take into consideration that the next largest accounts for only 6%. So uh, Frito-Lay is, as I say, the 10,000-pound uh, gorilla. Uh, here's uh, uh, a, bar, a pie chart uh, for uh, just savory snacks, uh, and you've got, uh, uh, and these are brands, uh, particular brands. So uh, Frito-Lay, um, number one, again, a great big bunch, and then the next one is Pringles, uh, a Procter & Gamble's brand. And, uh, of course, there are all these other uh, brands out here uh, in the other category. So it's not a cakewalk for Frito. It still has to compete. One of Frito's biggest competitors is the Mondelez. Uh, and Mondelez owns these brands, Ritz, Triscuit, uh, Oreo. You recognize them. Um, and if we just take a look at Mondelez, we've got 3% here. 2%, that's about 5.7%. Then we come over here with another three. So we've got 8.7%, about 9% of the biscuit market held by Mondelez. Look at the uh, share of the chips market, chips and crisps market that uh, Frito-Lay has uh, in PepsiCo. We've got 275 plus uh, 12.8, call it 13, you've got over 40% of the chips and crisps market uh, occupied by uh, three of Frito-Lay brands. And of course, Frito-Lay has more brand, a lot more brands than that. So the, again, when you look at uh, uh, the biscuits market segment in the, in the uh, snack, uh, snack food 
uh, industry. And then you look at uh, the chips and crisps, which we know is the big segment. Frito-Lay uh, is just in control. Very powerful. But when we get to India, uh, Lay's is not the 10,000 pound gorilla anymore. Uh, and we've got these local brands, Halderams, uh, and uh, it just uh, and these others are local brands too. So Lay's is in the running, uh, but uh, not all. It's not. It's not the 10,000 pound gorilla. Things are different in India, and so PepsiCo is going to have to come to grips with India as a completely different market. Now, Mrs. Nuyi, being an Indian. Uh, by uh, descent, uh, should be able uh, to figure that out. Here's the way snack food looks in uh, Asia. You can see that the, the largest consumption per capita is in uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, and China. Singapore and Hong Kong are wealthy. Uh, China's just big. Okay, but when we get down to India, look at the growth rate for India. 9% annual growth rate between, uh, projected between 2015 and 2021. That is really, if the, if the folks who did this slide, Euromonitor, are correct, then once again, uh, India is a great uh, growth market and a real target for growth. Notice the growth rates down here uh, for the leaders, 2.5%, uh, 2%. Percent, 2 percent. Uh, we get over here uh, to the Philippines where things are still growing a little bit. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we have a little bit more. Indonesia, still more. Uh, and by the way, the light bar uh, is the projection for 2021. Uh, the dark bar is the actual for 2016. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, growth is projected pretty much across the board, uh, but uh, India is where the real action is probably going to be. Uh, here is a, uh, again, uh, some more uh, of what we just saw with the product categories broken down. First is snacks, then snack bars, and then uh, ready meals. Uh, which are essentially uh, uh, breakfast cereals. And um, uh, over here we have the Philippines, then Singapore, uh, and the uh, growth rates are good. I mean, those are, you want to be there. But we get to India and look at the potential growth rates here. Not the potential growth rates. Uh, these are, were the growth rates in 2015. And folks, that's, that's really spectacular. Indonesia, also a very wealthy nation, Indonesia. So, um, and, and lots of growth potential, lots of industrial growth uh, there as well. So, boy, what I like to see, uh, an American uh, marketer would just love to see 17% growth. The heck, they'd like to see 10% growth, like in the Philippines. Uh, so, Asia is definitely where the action uh, in the future is, not just China. Uh, but uh, Southeast Asia uh, with the Philippines, Singapore, and Indonesia, uh, and Malaysia is not here, but it, it's also important. So strategic issues, uh, there's a big problem, and that is that Coke just, uh, just outguns PepsiCo in foreign markets. Um, and Coke gets 80% uh, and more of its volume outside the U.S., PepsiCo is just a little more than half. Uh, and yet the growth is in Asia, and it's outside the U.S. Um, there will be growth in the U.S., but it'll be because the U.S. Is, and Europe are both mature markets, uh, the rates of growth won't be as, as fast as they will be in Asia. So uh, it, it, PepsiCo is going to miss out on those opportunities if it doesn't uh, launch uh, a very aggressive strategy to move into them uh, more forcibly. For that reason, Pepsi is investing heavily in China, India, and as you know, Russia. Unfortunately, Russia has hit hard times economically. Uh, Coke uh, is investing 
um, very heavily uh, in developing markets. So PepsiCo has got, got its work cut out for it. Um, so in the snack food industry, there are other takeaways. Salty snacks, about 25% of the snack industry. That's, that's a big chunk. Uh, tortilla and corn chips uh, are really important. Potato chips also, you put the two of them together, you got almost half. Uh, PepsiCo is the top snack food marketer uh, in the U.S. with the biggest share, uh, but not in India. Um, Asia's retail consumption of snack foods forecasted to rise rapidly. Uh, and uh, India's especially rapidly. Uh, and uh, however, uh, the, the, there's a problem in the snack food industry, and that is that tr they traditionally have been baked in oils, which have cholesterol, uh, cause, uh, you know, heart problems, uh, you know, uh, arthro atherosclerosis. Uh, and uh, so, there's a uh, trend in the industry now to try to find uh, products that are not as bad for your health. When we get into strategy, we'll sure be talking about that. Um, this happens to be a, a pie chart showing uh, ready to eat cereal market shares and you see Quaker, the purple is essentially uh, not a, a non-player or a very small player. So, uh, at this point, we can start talking about product categories. Uh, we can show growth of the beverage market uh, from, and that's a, a, a typo, not form, from 2008 to 13. Uh, and again, you can see the growth of bottled water and tea, uh, surprisingly growing faster uh, than uh, carbonated soft drinks by uh, quite, remember this is over a five year period uh, but uh, uh, bottled water is the, is the uh, most important item on that chart. Um, this happens to be, if, if we go up here and look at fruit juice, we see it, it grew only 10%. And uh, this is a chart that this team put together to try to understand uh, just uh, what was going on in the juice industry. Uh, and we can see that orange juice is the biggest category but it's actually declined. Um, and frankly, when I saw this chart, I was really surprised. Uh, uh, what we see here is the uh, growth of apple juice. Um, I don't know who's drinking all that apple juice. I know I'm not one of them. Uh, but uh, and then we see these other juices in this other category is growing. But uh, this is relevant to PepsiCo's Tropicana brand. And it's, uh, I think that uh, what we will see is a whole lot more media advertising by PepsiCo to try to get consumption of Tropicana back up. Uh, and so the, uh, this is a chart that shows where uh, juice is consumed the most. And uh, no surprise, it's the U.S. Uh, but we do see that the uh, forecast for 2018 is lower than actual results in 2015. So uh, juices uh, just are not high on anybody's hit parade these days. Uh, soft drink market, on the other end, we've seen these results already, so I won't linger on them. Uh, Coke, uh, Coca-Cola sort of holding its own, uh, PepsiCo declining, uh, Dr. Pepper picking up a bit, uh, Kant is a uh, producer of private label drinks like the ones that you buy on Walmart that say uh, Sam's Club on them. But what we do see is sort of a, a weakening trend overall in that category. Um, and here is simply another chart that, that raises again or that shows again what the importance of bottled water is uh, and uh, where it's being consumed the most in Asia is the answer and uh, it, it's, it's more uh, desired perhaps in Asia uh, than in uh, North America. Uh, the reason being that uh, there aren't quite as many sources of clean, fresh water. Uh, so uh, uh, no surprise that it's really demanded. 
Um, the same for the Middle East and Africa. Uh, people just want to have uh, clean, fresh water. Uh, so, uh, and here we are now back in the chips. Uh, and as we've stated already, if you add tortilla chips, uh, uh, regular chips, uh, and I'm trying to find the other ones, but uh, 17 and 18 or 35 percent. Uh, snack bars, by the way, make up a healthy uh, chunk, 16 percent. And so the Quaker snack bars do have an opportunity for growth. See if I can keep moving here. Um, so what are the trends in the uh, industries that consume these products? And uh, here we see grocery stores. Uh, the 10,000 pound gorilla in the grocery store industry is Kroger. Look at the difference between Kroger and the next biggest out on the West Coast, Albertsons. Uh, and here we see a graph, a bar chart of, of what you see over in the table. So uh, some of these we see around here, Ahold, uh, Aldi. Um, uh, I thought there was another one that we've been seeing coming into this market. And of course, there's Walmart. Uh, but uh, uh, the 10,000 uh, uh, the, the pound gorilla is Kroger. Uh, and if you were to add Kroger and Albertsons together, uh, you'd get almost half of the industry. So again, PepsiCo wants to uh, really focus in on these big grocery chains uh, in order uh, to secure market shares in them. Now, here are the convenience stores. And these convenience stores are really important, and I'll explain why when we get to the next uh, e exhibit. But we see 7-Eleven, Chevron, the, you know, the gas stations, and we see here's uh, Sunoco, here's BP, Marathon, Shell. So a whole lot of the gasoline companies are, uh, their, their convenience stores are important players in this industry. Uh, and, uh, you know, there, there isn't quite the same difference between the leaders and the followers here uh, as there are in the grocery store chains. It's a much more fragmented industry. Now, let me get to uh, the fast food chains. Um, what happened at PepsiCo was uh, that as we pointed out in the history section in the last video, uh, PepsiCo tried to diversify. Uh, frankly, they tried to do vertical integration. They thought that they could buy uh, uh, quick service restaurant chains, namely uh, Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, and Kentucky Fried Chicken, and uh, make them all uh, serve Pepsi-Cola product and Pepsi-Co products, uh, not just Pepsi-Cola, but all of those beverages. And they, in fact, they did. Uh, but what happened was that Coke eventually figured out that they could go uh, to the fast food chains and, and point out to them that as subsidiaries of PepsiCo, uh, those three fast food chains, Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, and Kentucky Fried, were rivals of the other fast food chains like McDonald's and Burger King. Uh, and uh, simply point out to those chains that when they do business with PepsiCo, they're essentially feeding a rival. And with that, uh, Burger King was the one that reacted first, and they kicked PepsiCo and its drinks right out of their chain. And that woke up, as, and, as did Wendy's. Uh, and so uh, uh, it, it dawned on PepsiCo that they had a problem and that is they were competing with their customers. And uh, uh, they decided therefore to uh, divest, to sell, to get out of the fast food industry. And so they sold Taco Bell, um, uh, Pizza Hut, and Kentucky Fried Chicken, and they spun them off as a separate corporation. And since then, the, uh, that separate corporation changed its name is now called Yum Brands, and it's a very, very successful company, as it was when PepsiCo owned it. Uh, but if we look here at, the, uh, at which of these brands uses Coke and Pepsi 
you can see the Y means yes, okay? And one of them says neither, Starbucks. Um, but uh, if you then add their sales, uh, the sales of each of these companies, uh, and add them up, you can see uh, that Pepsi gets only about, a, uh, you know, that, that the ones that serve Pepsi are about only 25% of the quick service restaurant market. In short, Pepsi's probably got only about a 25% of the quick service restaurant industry because it made the mistake of competing with its customers. So as when that happened and when they had to get out of the industry, uh, it became very important to PepsiCo uh, to get as much of the business from these convenience stores, which were cropping up everywhere, as possible. And that still is the case. PepsiCo really wants this business because they know they can't get that business because uh, of the, uh, the, the effect and the history uh, that exists in the, uh, in the, the uh, fast food industry. Now, when PepsiCo sold uh, Taco Bell, uh, Kentucky Fried, and uh, 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 Pizza Hut, um, they wrote long-term contracts to supply those companies uh, with their own product. So uh, as you can see, they've kept uh, their, uh, their uh, involvement with those companies and continue, you can continue to get Pepsi products in those three companies. Okay, now let's talk about Diet Cokes. Whoops. Um, and what we see with Diet Cokes is that they also, or Diet Sodas, is they've underperformed. Uh, and why is that? It's because uh, there are uh, concerns about uh, the health effects of aspartame, the the sweetener in uh, sugar-free drinks. Uh, and consequently, PepsiCo has been introducing uh, water and other drinks that are sweetened, that are not sweetened with aspartame, uh, but use sucralose instead. Nevertheless, the diet category has sort of got this stigma. Um, and, um, and to make matters worse, um, carbonated beverages, uh, also uh, uh, often have uh, caffeine in them uh, because uh, they're intended to be stimulating. Um, and uh, so for all those reasons, it's a problem. Gatorade has kept its name because it's got a sports brand image and Gatorade, unlike other carbonated beverages, uh, has held up uh, and it continues to do all right. But diet sodas generally uh, are, are uh, in a uh, position of being disfavored by consumers. And so you can see uh, what's been going on in carbonated beverages generally, and these bar charts uh, show you. And uh, even Coke, the red bars, have come down pretty substantially. Uh, PepsiCo, however, has taken uh, the, the biggest uh, uh, losses in volume uh, with, uh, in its uh, carbonated beverage uh, categories. So let's talk a little bit about marketing trends. Um, and here again, we've got that same chart that we looked at before. A uh, big decline in carbonated beverages, holding your own in the non-carbonated uh, in the uh, sorry the uh, the the non-cola brands um, such as Gatorade and Sprite uh, and growth in water. Um, major competitors uh, we can we can see uh, that uh, the uh, uh, largest uh, of them all is PepsiCo, uh, Coke. Uh, is not as big as PepsiCo because PepsiCo sells snack foods as well as uh, soft drinks. And then there's everybody else. Coca-Cola Enterprises is part of that 38, okay? Essentially, Coca-Cola sells concentrate to Coca-Cola Enterprises, which is a big bottling company. And uh, then the, uh, the Coca-Cola Enterprises, like other bottlers, 
uh, puts uh, adds water to uh, or or sparkling water uh, and carbonation to uh, the uh, water and concentrate puts it in a bottle and distributes it to grocery stores. So part of that seven is up here in the 38. Um, but all in all, uh, about a hundred twenty billion dollar uh, business and uh, uh, pretty profitable. Uh, but once you once you see Coca Cola and PepsiCo, uh, the others uh, just aren't that important. Although Monster Beverage is one of those that I couldn't think of earlier. And at three billion dollars, it's uh, it's doing pretty well. And I think uh, I think somebody will probably try to buy that company pretty soon. I don't know whether it'll be PepsiCo, uh, but uh, it, it easily could be Coca-Cola. Um, here's just a, a look at the snack food industry, uh, the global snack and dairy products. Remember that uh, PepsiCo is in dairy products now too. And between 2009 and 2016, uh, the growth was 35%. That's pretty good. Um, and uh, on the other hand, Going forward, uh, this uh, market research firm expected the growth rates uh, to, to slow down maybe to 4%. Uh, it really depends upon uh, just where you look. As we saw earlier, some of the markets that PepsiCo is in, such as um, Southeast Asia uh, and India, uh, offer potential for a lot faster growth than that. Um, uh, and here's that same chart we saw earlier with, Pep, with Frito-Lay ahead of the crowd in snack foods. Um, uh, and uh, that's, that's one thing that uh, this, is, uh, this is a large presentation and there are a few uh, slides that sort of repeat themselves. So uh, one of the things that PepsiCo has been doing is trying to produce products uh, that are healthier. Uh, we will see in strategy that Indra Nooyi actually created a marketing campaign uh, called uh, uh, Good For You, uh, uh, Fun For You, Better For You, and Good For You. The Fun For You products are the ones that rot your teeth and, and cause you uh, to have hard arteries. Uh, the uh, Better For You don't do it as much. And the good for you are actually good for you. They're nutritious and don't cause atherosclerosis or cause your teeth to rot. Uh, so um, uh, here are some illustrations then of baked gluten-free and gluten-free products produced by uh, Frito-Lay. And uh, uh, they're doing quite well. So Mrs. Nui's campaign, her strategy of appealing to uh, folks' uh, desire for um, healthy, healthier uh, products uh, s seems to be paying off. Um, and uh, uh, remember that PepsiCo has acquired Wimbill Dan uh, in uh, Russia and has uh, subsequently gotten into other dairy products. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the, there's a possibility uh, that PepsiCo uh, could tap into the dairy products market and find themselves with a, another growth category. And uh, again, when we get into strategy, I think we'll see, uh, we'll hear more about that. Uh, so outside uh, the U.S., uh, markets contributed 42% of PepsiCo's revenues, 19% from Mexico, Canada, Russia, UK, Brazil, um, and uh, emerging countries uh, growing uh, pretty rapidly. Uh, so, uh, but it's, it's the, the, uh, the Asian markets, China and India, as well as Southeast Asia and Mexico, uh, that's where the real fast action is expected to be. Uh, and uh, uh, here uh, is a, uh, and, and again, some of these slides are a little bit out of sequence, and I'm sorry for that. Uh, but you can see the relative size uh, for carbonated soft drinks. Uh, this slide probably belongs much earlier in the presentation, so I'm sorry that we're uh, jumping back and forth like that. But you can see that China uh, in 2014, now that was three years ago, 
uh, and it was second to the U.S. Uh, we know that in the U.S. the consumption's going down, but we also know that in China and Mexico, consumption is going up. Remember the uh, the uh, uh, Latin American countries uh, kind of like soft drinks, so uh, and China does too. So I think what we'll, we would probably see is that uh, China, in particular, is gaining on the U.S. Um, here we have a little graphic that shows that about half of the bottled water market is in North America, uh, and that the growth rate, remember we, we saw earlier that one marketing company, market research company, thought that the growth of water uh, would be only about 4%. Now we see another one saying that they think 6.5%. I'm more inclined to believe that one. Here we see a comparison, and this is Coke's top 10 markets as opposed to PepsiCo's. And uh, this is in uh, the, uh, uh, let's see, the uh, billions of cases, each of which have 24 bottles. Um, but you can see that second to the US uh, is Mexico. As I said earlier, Mexico uh, just loves, car and, and Latin America loves carbonated beverages, and uh, they really like Coke. Uh, China is number three, uh, and uh, we would expect that th if this, was, this measure was taken in 2011, we would expect that China has by this time really moved out. I assume that Mexico has too, but I also assume that China has moved faster. These are just uh, uh, some summary brands uh, of carbonated drinks, fruit drinks, and uh, energy type or sports drinks offered by Coke and PepsiCo. I don't think that we have a whole lot to talk about here, except that Coke has more of those brands in India than PepsiCo does. That doesn't mean that they sell more. Uh, Mountain Dew is popular. Uh, and uh, when we get over to uh, fruit-based drinks, Tropicana, we saw earlier, uh, is pretty popular. Uh, I doubt that Minute Maid is as popular, and we know that Gatorade is, is, a, is a winner. So uh, you can't always judge uh, the uh, picture by the number of brands, but you do have to be impressed by just how much of an investment Coke has made in India. And uh, Pepsi needs to take a lesson there. So here are some of the major brands of Coke, Pepsi, and other producers in uh, India. Uh, and you can recognize some, others you don't recognize. Uh, and then you see these domestic brands. And this Parla Agro, uh, it's, uh, it's a comer. It's a very strong player in India. I think we'll see it again in just a minute. Here is an ad that, was, that we found in India. This was, is recently uh, run. I don't, uh, it looks like it's on a website. And basically what it says is, don't drink carbonated beverages because they're terrible for you. Uh, and they tell, give you all the reasons why. Uh, so no surprise that there's a preference uh, in India for things other than carbonated beverages. Um, and so here's the carbonated soft drink market in India. Uh, here uh, happens to be PepsiCo's, uh, 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 now it says soft drink, but uh, frankly, this is Aquafina, which is uh, a, a bottled water. And uh, you can see that it's grown some uh, from 2012 to 13. Uh, one thing you might want to look at is just the uh, notice that Pepsi the brand Pepsi has come down. Here are Coke's drinks over here. Uh, here's a, but here's a local drink, uh, and it has grown rapidly, uh, and it's the, it appears to be the leader in this, this category of, I guess what you'd call commercial drinks, commercial beverages, rather than soft drinks. Um, soft drinks uh, connoting carbonated. Uh, and uh, here's another Pepsi drink, uh, Slice. Uh, and so if you put all the Pepsi uh, brands together, uh, they do pretty well. Uh, but uh, here we've got another Coke drink. Uh, so uh, 
uh, it, uh, this, is, this is kind of a hodgepodge, uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, the, the healthy drinks are, uh, such as water, seem to be doing okay. Here's Slice doing okay. Uh, we see, on the other hand, uh, that uh, regular carbonated beverages are, are declining. Okay, uh, so uh, retail juice market, you've got Coke and Pepsi, and it, it you, was back in 2014 that Pepsi was the leader, and Coke caught up uh, with them in 2015. And here's this Parva Agro uh, and other local brands, the domestic Indian brands. So uh, it, it's, uh, it's a much more competitive uh, market. Uh, and here, here then is the overall uh, market share standing. And Coke uh, has uh, declined from 2011 to 15. Pepsi has declined less, but it's definitely in second place uh, versus Coca-Cola. And this is a, a real problem uh, for PepsiCo because, again, India is the growth market of the future. Uh, now, I won't bore you with this chart except to let you know that this parley uh, bestlery, I've, uh, I've spoken with people from India. They say it's a real comer uh, and uh, that it's got a large uh, share uh, in its category. Uh, globally, it's, it's, it's nothing, uh, but in India, it's a really important player, uh, and uh, it, it, I guess that's the point. Globally, it's global share, which is what this uh, axis here means. Uh, it's, uh, uh, let's see, uh, it, I'm sorry, this is its share in India, and uh, the... Uh, what do we have here? The uh, growth rates. And so uh, it, uh, this, this brand and this company have a uh, high share of India and they're growing very fast. So if you will, this is sort of a, a BCG matrix done backwards and Parley Bisclery is a star in India. And that, that's, uh, that, that point was made just to uh, show uh, that the uh, brands that we think of as leaders, Coke and Pepsi, are, are not uh, necessarily the stars that they are in the more developed uh, markets. Okay, this takes us to health concerns, a real issue in this industry. And what we see is uh, that uh, incidence of overweight is rising uh, over time. Uh, and that incidence of obesity is also rising, and these are proportions of the global population here. And this is a, a real epidemic. There's just no way, other way to look at it. Um, and rates have increased in uh, virtually all countries, some more than others. The worst, of course, is the U.S., and the second worst, remarkably, uh, is Mexico. Uh, so it's the largest consumer of soft drinks, and it's got the largest uh, problem uh, with obesity. Uh, we can see that, uh, surprisingly, Australia, you know, for, with its uh, sports interest, uh, and uh, uh, the United Kingdom are also uh, it, it have been grown rapidly uh, in the experience of this problem. But the number one problem of all is the United States. Um, here we simply have uh, age-adjusted uh, percentages with uh, diabetes. Uh, the dotted line indicates today, and the, uh, to the right side of it is a forecast. But you can see that it's been growing. Why is this important? Because uh, drinks such as Coke and Pepsi-Cola have a lot of sugar in them. Uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, as these health concerns become more apparent and of greater concern to the public, uh, PepsiCo has decided that it is going to have to respond to that by developing a healthier mix of products. Uh, Coke's products are 
much less uh, in the healthy category, but they've started to come on with them now too. Here's another problem, and uh, this is uh, uh, low bone mass and osteoporosis. Uh, and uh, you can see that uh, incidence of both low bone mass and osteoporosis have been growing over the past, uh, uh, what, uh, 10, 2010 to 2000, uh, well, 2010, uh, we see what it was, 2020, it's expected to have grown uh, pretty significantly and so forth. Um, and uh, uh, it has been established that uh, ladies' uh, tendency to experience osteoporosis is related to their consumption of carbonated beverages when they are teenagers and young women. Uh, and uh, as I said earlier, uh, that was a big uh, factor in the uh, development of the uh, healthy food and beverage uh, movement. Uh, here are simply some facts about the growth uh, of osteoporosis, and I'll let you read them rather than linger on them here. Suffice it to say that women have, uh, have, are, are more likely to uh, suffer this problem than men are, but men also have the problem. Uh, so uh, uh, it's, uh, it's something that uh, manufacturers of carbonated beverages are going to be faced with more and more. Uh, so, uh, there are health concerns with the uh, savory snack categories of uh, snack foods. Uh, savory snacks are, are not the only ones. We have the baked and the, uh, the other kind of snack uh, products that, that, that Frito-Lay makes. But there have been uh, real uh, concerns about uh, sugary beverages and uh, snack foods that are uh, have cholesterol uh, be in them because of the fact that they're they're uh, uh, fried in oil. And the uh, second largest international market uh, after Russia uh, is Mexico, and Mexico. Uh, is a uh, is a major consumer of salty snacks and carbonated beverages, um, and so uh, uh, Mexico uh, is uh, is a major market for PepsiCo products. But uh, the real question is uh, when will Mexico, is, when will its government come to grips with the health issues and beverages, uh, carbonated beverages, and snack foods. Uh, and uh, again, you can see down at the bottom, Mexico has highest obesity and diabetes rates. Uh, that's not true, is it? We saw in a chart earlier that the U.S. Uh, is number one, but after that, it's, it's Mexico. Uh, so this is a real issue uh, for both Coke and uh, PepsiCo. And how PepsiCo responds to it is, is the strategic uh, question here. So finally, uh, we have this uh, rather interesting video, uh, and th or, or rather visual. Uh, this is another m advertisement uh, that was in uh, the in media of India. And you can just re read the uh, remarks about carbonated beverages here. Um, I, I think what they're trying to tell you is that carbonated beverages will kill you. Look at all this stuff with your kidneys and your bones and your lungs and your teeth and your brain. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the, another illustration of why uh, in India uh, the culture uh, has affected uh, the uh, preferences for different categories of products. So. Here are some conclusions to all that we've been looking at. Diabetes, big problem. Uh, sugar drinks, uh, adding to, to obesity. Um, and uh, I've already uh, mentioned to you uh, the fact that women are uh, more prone to uh, osteoporosis um, if they drink carbonated beverages when they're young. 
Uh, and the incidence of osteoporosis apparently is likely to increase just because uh, people were drinking these products before they it was known uh, what their impacts are. Uh, so uh, here we just have some more uh, con uh, conclusions uh, that we've already talked about. So uh, with that, I'll, I think what I'm going to do is stop this video again because uh, I think you need a break as we go through each one of these items. What this means is uh, that there are going to be more videos, frankly, than I thought. Uh, there could be as many as five. Uh, I'll try not to make it that high, but um, this, I think this is probably enough for, for right now. And I think that, uh, by the way, all of these uh, PowerPoints will be on Moodle so that you can look at them and review them before you take the exam. So uh, with that, I will uh, stop the recording, uh, say goodbye, and uh, see you when we talk uh, about the industry structure next and also uh, the, uh, the internal capabilities of PepsiCo. After that, we'll go on to goals, strategy, and implementation. So I'll say goodbye now and uh, see you in the next video. Bye.